For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. <clears throat> because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but because futile, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man <clears throat> and birds and four-footed beasts <clears throat> and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, <clears throat> for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, turn, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors, uh, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. <clears throat> if this particular uh, reading from Scripture does not describe the present day America, and maybe the entire world for the most part, I don't know what does. But the reason that it exists is because people are not obedient to the gospel. <clears throat> When one is not obedient to the gospel, what is there? Well, we see what the result of that is. By and large, this nation is not uh, obedient to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that is the only thing that's going to uh, correct the malice and the evil that's in this nation or any nation. That is the only thing that's going to do it. So, rather than, as some are want to do, to break the law in order to uphold the law, which has always seemed inconsistent to me, the gospel needs to be preached, and people need to, to obey the gospel. And that's not only nearly it, that is it. Shall we begin our study with a prayer, would you bow me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word, for the guidance that it provides us, for, for the light that it shines upon our path, that we may know where to walk, and for giving us an example of, of how to walk. We pray Thy blessing upon this study. We're grateful for those of old who have been that spokesman, and that Thy Word was recorded for the benefit of us living today. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
<clears throat> We're uh, currently in uh, Zechariah, <clears throat> if you turn the first chapter. <clears throat> <clears throat> we uh, halted at uh, verse 12 and there's a series of eight uh, visions and we're already into the first visions and we had a very uh, worthwhile and informative discussion on color of horses and <clears throat> And, you know, I've been enlightened, so I didn't have the benefit of Ashland. Yeah, Ashland could have told us exactly what these uh, colors are. <clears throat> Red horse is like a fire engine, and white horse is like, not like a fire engine. <laughs> so, and, the, and the sorrel, you know, it's kind of like, uh, <clears throat> uh, Ulysses S. Grant, you know, he he was uh, actually tone deaf. He he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket with both hands on the handle. Couldn't do it. Somebody asked him, you know, what what songs do you know? He said, I only know two songs. One is uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy, and and the other one isn't. <laughs> so, so that's my uh, deal about horses. <laughs> I know red and white horses, but I don't know anything else. <laughs> but anyway, uh, in this first vision, of course, they had the horses, and uh, they were walking about and making report on the, uh, the world, and the world was quiet. And this, this particular time, it was quiet. You know, all the uh, heathen nations, they were not at this particular time warring. They were at peace, and even though they still had everything under the control, but he says here, and uh, of course there, there are angels that are uh, talking here, and then the angel of the Lord answered and said, uh, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? And of course there's the question of what 70 years is he talking about, because there's really two 70 year uh, 70 years that are relevant here. In this discussion, one is the first 70 year period is from when uh, Babylon first invaded uh, Judah and in, if you want to say 605 or 606 BC, depending on where you start, and it ended in uh, 536, that's when Babylon was overthrown and the Jews began to return. But the other 70-year period began in, in 586, and that's when uh, Jerusalem itself, when the uh, temple was destroyed, and it was not uh, uh, rebuilt until 516 B.C., which is another 70-year period. And so which 70-year uh, period is it? I don't know, but uh, I don't know that it matters all that much which one it is. It is you know, the view of the Jews was that God was uh, angry with them these 70 years. Whatever 70-year period you want to start, he was angry with them. And so the Lord answered here in verse 13. Uh, he, he talked to me and had good and comforting words. Well, we get more into the good and comforting words later, but it, it's... Uh, it's assurance that uh, Jerusalem is going to be uh, restored and the temple is going to be uh, rebuilt and so forth. So in verse 14 he says, So the angel who spoke with me said to and he might want to go through these and figure out which angels talking about because there's more than one angel being talked about. So if you want to go and kind of analyze that and see which one it is. But anyway, he said, The angel who spoke to me with me said to me, Proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. So we know that it has it's an authoritative uh, message from God himself. I am zealous for Jerusalem. That is, I have a love for Jerusalem. You know, it's uh, my city. I, you know, I love it. And Zion with great zeal. And Zion, of course, is the, uh, the mountain 
Temple Mount where the temple is. So he has great zeal for that. And I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. Remember the horses went around, they found everything uh, peaceful. And he's talking about the heathen nations. You know, they're, they're not warring right now, but he's exceedingly angry with them. For I was a little angry with the nation of uh, Judah. And the, they helped, the, the heathen nations helped but they didn't do it out of a uh, good uh, intent. They were, uh, their intent was evil. Of course, that does mean that God will use evil nations. We saw that in uh, Haggai. It will use evil nations to effect His judgment. But they, in turn, must be punished. They helped, but with evil intent. Therefore, he says in verse 16, there, uh, this says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it. The temple is going to be restored, says the Lord of hosts. And a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Well, a surveyor's line is when they're, uh, they're establishing the meets and bounds of something. You know, if... If you uh, bought a property, and I guess most of you bought a property, you, you had a surveyor that uh, gave you the meets and bounds of the property. So you know what you own. And so your neighbor knows what he doesn't own. So so this uh, surveyor's line is going to be stretched out over Jerusalem to establish the, the boundaries, if you will. In verse 17, again, uh, proclaim... Again, proclaim saying, this says the Lord of hosts. And he gives three blessings here. My cities shall again spread out through prosperity. Now it's not city, it's plural, cities. So not only Jerusalem, but there's going to be cities around there that are going to be blessed. They're going to spread out and be blessed also. They're going to have prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion. Well, that's a blessing to, you know, the Temple Mount. And will again choose Jerusalem. Jerusalem, again, is going to be the capital of the nation of Israel. And here, in starting verse 18, we have the second vision. He says, Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. Now, you have to keep in mind what, uh, in uh, apocalyptic language, what four means. It got the four corners of the earth, four winds, uh, four beasts, and it, it's just a, a number representing, uh, the, you know, all the world uh, powers and, and what have you. And there have been a lot of uh, commentators trying to assign nations to these four horns without that much success, so I think is really just talking about nations in general, those that uh, exercise power. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? So he answered me, he said, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Well, we know the scattering from Assyria and uh, Babylon, but there's going to be more scattering than that in the future. So it, uh, again, is referring to more than just the nations that have already existed at this time. And I said to the angel who talked to them, what are these? He, well, he says these are the, the horns that have scattered uh, Judah, Israel, and uh, Jerusalem. Then the Lord, Lord showed me four craftsmen, and that's, and when we think of craftsmen, uh, you might think of uh, somebody that we might call a blacksmith or something like that. Somebody that uh, engages in manual labor. So he showed me four craftsmen, and I said, what are these coming to do? So he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, the horns. 
So you got uh, one party that's uh, scattering Judah, and you got another party that's going to terrorize the nations that have scattered Judah. He said to terrify them to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. So the, <clears throat> these uh, craftsmen are God's uh, instruments or the designated uh, powers that's going to destroy the world powers. <clears throat> so in chapter 2 here we have uh, the, the third vision that, that uh, is related to us. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, what are you, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem. And to see what is its width and what is its length. You know, what will, what will it accommodate? And there was the angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him. Again, you got another angel, so if you want to plot this out, but all these angels. Uh, another angel was coming out to meet him, who said to him, Run, speak to this young man. Now, who is this young man? Is it the, is it the prophet? Or is it the man with the measuring line? Um, probably the man with the measuring line, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. Now, keep in mind that uh, during these times, walls were very important because they kept out uh, enemies and what have you. But here he's describing Jerusalem as a city without walls, so it's... it's uh, Probably not talking about the physical Jerusalem, but the spiritual Jerusalem. For I, says the Lord, verse 5, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Well, that's got to be a spiritual Jerusalem. You know, there's no wall of fire around Jerusalem, physical Jerusalem. So... This, anytime there's a fire around uh, the city, it's a protection. So the spiritual Jerusalem is going to be protected. It's not going to be uh, able to be assaulted by uh, enemies. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven. Again, you know, the four says the Lord. Now, it's interesting about this up, up, and that's in the New King James Version. And in verse 7, it also says up Zion. But in the King James, it says uh, ho, ho, and then o. Oh. Now, don't get... Just because it says ho, ho, you... <laughs> Now, in the ASV, it says, ho, ho, ho. So that's obviously some guy that's working in a mall as a Santa Claus. <clears throat> At least that's what one commentator said. I'm, I forgot his name. <laughs> but it's interesting, if you want to get an idea of how translators work, uh, this up, up, and the uh, up in verse 7, they're, they're hortatives. And I don't let that word carry off. Hortative just means ex ex exhortation. It's uh, encouraging somebody to take an action. But it's also uh, one of my uh, poetic language. And again, don't let that word scare you off. Onomatopoetic, onomatopoetic, poetic, it just means, for example, um, when we say uh, uh, maybe you're on a roller coaster and you say we, well, you spell it the same way, the same way it sounds. And if you go to the Hebrew, it's up, up, or ho, ho. If you were to pronounce it in Hebrew, it sounds like ho. So in English, you know, the King James uh, translators and the uh, ASV tr translators 
translated as ho, or o, ho. And where the up up comes from, I don't know. But it's it's a it's an an encouragement or an exhortation to uh, get busy, do what is going to follow. So here it says, up up, flee from the land of the north, and that's uh, yeah, you, north. You're talking about Babylon, or Babel, or uh, I think the word really means a land of confusion. Uh, get out of there. Well, by this time, there are a lot of Jews that had already gotten out, so there's still some Jews left there. It said, uh, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. So <clears throat> he, he's telling them to get out, get out of the uh, land of the north. In verse 7, he says, up Zion. Escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. And it is usually the case that uh, the society in which you dwell, eventually you're going to adopt some of those uh, characteristics of that society, just the influence. So to escape the influence of the daughter of Babylon, get out of there. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory. Now you have to kind of read this as God sent me the angel after glory to the nations which plunder you. Uh, and that's the heathen nations that plunder uh, you know, Judah and Israel, Jerusalem. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Now this apple of the eye, you know, that's an expression that we use, but it's really the uh, very sensitive part of the eye, of the uh, uh, iris uh, of the eye, very sensitive. So anybody, that, you know, whenever that's touched, it hurts. So this hurts him, and uh, he's not going to stand for it. Verse 9, For surely I will shake my hand against them, and that's all he has to do, shake his hand, and it's done. And they shall become spoil for their servants. Uh, servants, of course, are uh, tasked with the uh, rendering, well, service to their masters. But here it says, I'm, I can just shake my hand, and the servants are going to take over. They're going to, you're going to become spoil for the servants. Then you will know what the Lord of, that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, the daughter of Zion, as opposed to the daughter of Babylon. The daughter of Zion is of the faithful, the daughter of Babylon or not. For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst. That has to be very comforting to know that uh, the Lord is going to be dwelling within the midst of these people. It says, verse 10, sing and rejoice. Uh, well, it says, I will, uh, verse 10, I will dwell in your midst. In verse 11, many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people. What he's talking about, well, he can be talking about Jews, but it's also talking about Gentiles. They're also going to be joined in that day Uh to, as one people, there is not going to be any division then between Jew and Gentile. Well, there's got to be a reference to the uh, Messianic uh, period where the church will be established and then all people will be uh, invited to render obedience to the gospel of Christ and thereby being added to the church. There will be no division, Jew or Gentile, at that point in time. And again he says, uh, and I will dwell in your midst. He said in 10, he says in 11, I will dwell in your midst. Uh, great comfort. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. That's proof. That's the proof that uh, he has been sent from the Lord. And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose 
Jerusalem. Just like it said here previously that we uh, talked about Jerusalem is going to be the capital city again. He's going to choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, all flesh, in verse 13, before the Lord, for He is aroused from His holy habitation. And we have something similar to that in Habakkuk 2.20. Be silent. And uh, so, again, it's the idea that when you're in the presence of God, you listen to Him. You be silent and you listen to Him. You do what He says. In chapter 3, we start the fourth vision. Then He showed me Joshua, the high priest, and he's really representative of the priesthood, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem again. That phraseology, chosen Jerusalem. Uh, The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now this this idea of uh, uh, Satan standing at the right hand to oppose the uh, angel, what that really is signifying that, that, that Satan is going to say, well, look, all God ever does is punish you. That's all he ever does, just punish you. And if that's all God ever did, then Satan would be right. But he doesn't. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. He's a forgiving God. He rebukes him. Is this not a, a brand plucked from the fire? Jerusalem, who has sinned grievously and been punished for it, uh, God redeems him. God redeems him as, as if they had been plucked from the fire. So that destroys the Satan, Satan's premise altogether that all God does is uh, condemn and punish. So, you know, you know, whether Satan ever realized that that's what God was going to do, you know. We know that's what he wanted. God only to punish, but God is not that way. In verse 3, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Now Joshua was the, the priest, the high priest, and was standing before the angel. Now kind of get this image in your mind of uh, the high priest. How were they clothed? It's a very ornate, uh, very uh, glorious type of clothing. It was was, uh, really something to behold. But here it says, um, clothed with filthy garments. A high priest wouldn't be clothed in filthy garments. Unless it's sin, unless a high priest wasn't doing what he ought to do, even though his physical garments may be pristine and glorious, his spiritual garments are filthy. So he said uh, to those who uh, stood before him, that's the angel, saying, take away these filthy garments from him. And to him he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. Again, that's the idea of of, uh, forgiveness uh, on the basis of the repentance of the high priest or or the priesthood in in this case. The priesthood hadn't done what it's supposed to do, and and once they repent, he replaced those spiritually dirty garments with uh, clean garments. Again, that puts the lie to uh, Satan's assertion that God only punishes. In verse 5, he said, uh, and I said, let them put a clean turban. Uh, Your translation may have mitre. Uh, Clean turban, that's very uh, rich looking head gear on the head. And they, they put the clothes on him. That's the clean clothes. And that uh, signifies the 
uh, the clean clothes and the the turban, the clean turban, signify the, the holiness of the uh, priest. And the angel of the Lord stood by. In verse 6, Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, and he's going to have uh, three charges and then three promises. This says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my way, you know, you, you have to have personal uh, righteousness. And the only way you can do that, as we mentioned, is uh, nowadays it's the gospel. If you want to walk in righteousness, you have to walk in the gospel. And if you will keep my commands, you know, uh, priests have certain duties to tend to, to fulfill. And so, it's saying, Joshua, you have to fulfill those duties and obligations and be faithful to them. And uh, then you will also judge my house. And that's really a failure of the priests is that they had the law and they should have been teaching that law and seeing that the people obeyed the law and they, they weren't doing it. And so, you shall judge my house. Again, all these things are based upon uh, obedience. Each one of these things is dependent upon uh, one's obedience. And a part of that is you'll also have uh, charge of my courts. And they're responsible for the you know, various courts uh, in the temple and also courts of judgment. And they'll have charge of that. And they must fulfill the obligations of those offices uh, faithfully and fairly. I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. And he's talking about the, uh, the angels that are, that are standing there with him at the moment. I'll give you a place to walk among these who stand here. And in verse 8, Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, he's talking about all the priests, for they are a wondrous sign for behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. Well, this branch is talked about uh, a number of times in Scripture, and it's going to be talked about later on in, in Zechariah. And it's a, a messianic uh, allusion to uh, Christ himself. And it's spoken of in various places in Isaiah, uh, Number of places in Jeremiah, it's called the branch, called the rod uh, of Jesse, the root of Jesse, uh, various names for it. But he's going to bring forth the branch, the root of Jesse, the uh, rod of Jesse. He's going to bring forth. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. <clears throat> And again, this is mentioned uh, later about the seven. And, we'll, and it's mentioned down in uh, chapter 4, verse 10. Seven eyes. And behold, I will engrave its inscription. So there's something going to be written on this, this stone. Now what stone is it? It's not the foundation because uh, the temple because that's already been laid. But it, the temple hadn't been finished yet. So it, it could be, I'm not saying it is, could be the uh, capstone. You know, when you finish building a stone wall, you put a capstone that finishes it up. Could be that, just indicating that uh, this is going to be uh, finished. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Well, this land, physical land, iniquity is not going to be removed. In fact, it, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed again, A.D. 70. So what day is it talking about? Well, again, if it's a, a messianic illusion, then it's going to be the day that the church is established. 
In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his tree. Now, this phraseology, under his vine and under, under his tree, is a uh, allusion to peace and security, because you know vines, grape vines, and uh, fig trees and or olive trees, stuff like that. That, that was a very um, essential element of, of the economy of, of that. If you had a vine and fig tree, you're doing pretty well. You can sit under it. So it's, it's indicating peace and security. But that's all going to happen in that day that this uh, uh, spiritual Jerusalem is going to, spiritual temple is going to be established. And we'll start next time at uh, chapter 4. Thank you.